Ah, the young guerrilla fighter of the High Elves. Brave of him to invade the very lands of his mortal enemy. Brave but reckless, for only one with a death wish would seek out such an enemy in their very home. Makes me wonder if he isn't some kind of dwarf slayer, but even they wouldn't be so stupid to provoke the wrath of so many enemies at the same time. Deaths in battle for the dwarves must serve a purpose after all. This young lads will serve none, I think. That will be enough out of you, vampire. I have journeyed far from home, it is true, but a true warrior seeks out his enemy where they are, not sitting by in their perfumed homes, waiting for that enemy to come to them. The nobles of Ulthuan are utter fools, content on their precious island, thinking themselves safe and secure beyond their magic and fortifications. But that safety is a lie, an illusion they conjure up because they cannot face the harsh reality of this world. Even if I must fight alone against the entire might of the Dark Elves, I say let them come. They shall not find us wanting. Welcome everyone, Kwasin here with what I consider one of the best campaigns in Total War Warhammer 3 and my personal favorite campaign in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. That's because it can be a very difficult campaign, but unlike other difficult campaigns, let's say Kislev or some other races, or rather difficult campaign starts or difficult campaigns in general, you have all of the tools needed to succeed, you just need to use them. So I'm sure a lot of people don't necessarily like this campaign as much as me, but really if you're an experienced player, you know what you're doing, you can really have a blast playing this campaign because it's very well designed for someone that knows what they're doing. Or not necessarily well designed, but it just kind of ended up that way being a really great campaign. So you start over here with the monoliths. It's a tier 2 settlement. You also start with your special unit recruitment structure, the camp. Now the camp allows you to recruit one unique unit and one unit that's available to everyone else at tier 3. So you can recruit Shadow Walkers in this campaign, which are unique to Alif and R. Or you can recruit Shadow Warriors. I believe Shadow Warriors require you to own a DLC, if I'm not mistaken, or was it available to everyone else? I can't keep track of all of the DLCs, honestly, of this, this game. It might have been Alarial's DLC, if I'm not mistaken, because I think that's when uh, that's when they reveal that. But it, either way, even if you can only recruit Shadow Walkers, they're still really great units. And Leaf Nar himself, um, they, he basically gains a significant upkeep benefit uh, to them, and he gets an ambush success chance benefit to his entire army. Now, here's the thing about uh, this uh, this situation. So you can either recruit Shadow Warriors or Shadow Walkers. I would start recruiting Shadow Warriors once you're dealt uh, done with your initial uh, or turn one battles in this campaign. Campaign fi faction wise, you get campaign movement range of 10%, always powerful bonuses, a bonus, a unique right, and unique assassination missions. Now these are randomized from the very start of your campaign so you can get some really good ones or some really shitty ones the ones i got here are not necessarily great because instead of getting one to eliminate this army you're always going to get one against karen Carr because they're a faction you start a war with but instead of getting one against this particular army i got one for this particular army it i would recommend starting this campaign at least a couple of times to at least get uh, one against this army and if you can get another one against this lord you just need to eliminate the lord that would be the best situation. That's the way you can get a good uh, campaign start. But regardless of that, that's not necessarily the important bit over here for Elif and Arm. Now, that right summons a hero that's capable of assassinating without failing. So you can use that hero to uh, do these murder missions, or you can use that hero uh, in, an, in a campaign to eliminate a really powerful legendary lord. So for instance, let's say you end up fighting Valkia. Well, Valkia is really the heart of her army, so if you can eliminate her before the battle, there's a significant benefit you're going to get in that particular uh, battle, or Sigvald, or some other lords. Now, on top of that, Alif Anar's skill line, he gets fear, he gets various benefits for Shadow Warriors and Shadow Walkers, income from post-battle loot, sacking uh, and looting settlements, missile strength uh, when fighting Dark Elves, an ambush success chance, missile strength for all armies faction-wide of plus 12 for only minus 8 diplomatic relations with the High Elves, as well as uh, clone uh, ability. He already starts with an image, but this just uh, improves it even further. It can be a pretty powerful ability. Now, Alifanar also gets 15% uh, campaign movement range when winning a battle and perfect vigor. Now, here's the thing about Alifanar. He's actually useless in ranged, because ranged lords and heroes are not really effective. Maybe with 3.0, they're going to improve that. I guess we'll have to wait and see on that. But at the moment, ranged lords and heroes can struggle to get many shots off, so they can be—they uh, won't necessarily be that great. The thing is, with Alifanar, 
because of some other skills he gets, like slippery, uh, slippery for instance over here, the Ward of Loic, all that kind of stuff, the Speed of Asurian, all High Elven Lords have that, but he can get, he can be quite useful as a distraction in melee in particular with his clone. So it can be useful from that particular uh, perspective. He also starts with 15% ward save and 20% missile resistance for units in range. So he has a great deal of survivability, far more so than you might think, just because he has that 17% ward save from the very, very start on himself. So the way you use Alifanar himself in battle is, I guess the term would be a distraction carnifex. He's not really important, like your army will deal the damage, he's just there to soak the damage. He doesn't necessarily have the highest HP, but can really, really distract an enemy in the battle when it comes to it. So that's how you'd use Alifanar. Now, what's great about this campaign is, as you may have noted from the skill tree, the faction effects, the rights, you have a lot of power. It gets even better because your basic movement stance on every single army, not just the Leafanar, but the other armies as well, is um, is an ambush stance. Now, it's not a particularly good ambush stance. I'm trying to find a lord that can I can use uh, over here. Not necessarily incompetent. Let's see what we can get. Squishy, not necessarily great, not great, not great. Damn, did I really just get a bunch of really horrible lords over here at the start? Some I could use, I suppose, without too many issues. The one you really want to go for is Ridiculed because you don't care about Phoenix recruitment. That's the kind of lord, the kind of mage. And you just get another lord over here. You do, you, and you might want to start global recruitment, uh, recruitment if you can eliminate an army here for extra rewards. By the way, What's great about this campaign, every army has an ambush stance. Every army has an underway uh, stance as well. You lack the magic stance, but you don't care about that because just the sheer movement benefit getting from the underway and the ambush benefit in battles is so very significant. Every time you attack an army, you have a chance of ambushing them. Now, it won't have the best ambush success chance, but what's interesting about this is obviously a leaf and gets that extra ambush success chance. But you can improve it for other lords by playing an Alfarian campaign, not necessarily a huge campaign as Alfarian, and getting the shadow trait for other lords and then saving those characters. And what you can do over here is you can go and load the character that you've saved from another campaign. Maybe a bit lower level than this, so you can recruit them early on in the campaign, but that's one of the choices you do have over here to really get a great deal of power with Alifanar. But you're, regardless of what you do, you're still going to have a ridiculous amount of power. Just having the ambush success, uh, ambush uh, stance is going to be very significant over here. What's great here, though, you have a lot of power, but you're also in an exposed position. You could abandon this province if you wanted to make your situation easier, but unlike Boris Ursus, you have all the tools and all the capability to succeed over here. You don't need to hold these provinces, by the way. You could just raise Karen Cart to the ground and then get the hell out of here. But if you decide to fight here, you it's, it can be a great campaign. So Helebron is to the north, Malekith is to the northwest. Further north, you have Valka, and to the northeast, you have Sigvald. And you're likely going to end up fighting all four of them at once. Uh, or at least two of them at once, and then as you progress into their territory, you will encounter Valkyrie and Sigvald. Then to the west, you have Tarax, Katep as well. He may be an issue in this campaign, in particular if you ally the Sisters of Twilight, because Katep and the Sisters may end up in a war. My personal advice when it comes to that, Wood Elves are not, don't make great allies, the Tomb Kings make better allies. Go to war with the Wood Elves, annihilate them, sack the Witchwood, get all the money, because it can be a ridiculous amount of money from these uh, trees. Get the money, eliminate the sisters, and then move on your way and make an alliance with Katep, because you can do so as well. Don't ally the sisters against Katep, that can end up poorly. To the east, you have Norskai and, of course, Belakor. Belakor, in particular, is very aggressive against all his neighbors, and he will launch naval invasions if you're playing any faction that starts next to him. Instead of the reasonable thing, which would be for him to invade Norska and basically put, him, uh, put it under his thumb, Belakor's AI doesn't really achieve anything in the campaign because he's just wasting his time um, uh, trying to attack factions he, uh, like across the sea, like Bretonia, the... Uh, the high elves, all that, so he really wastes his potential. He does have a great defeat trait, so you can really farm him, not to eliminate him, just farm him for his defeat trait, and then eventually eliminate him when you do decide to just deal with the Norskanist situation or just deal with Alpian uh, situation over here. Though, 
Like with other factions that you expand against, like eliminating Bellacor just opens you up to Norska. Maybe all of Norska, dependent on how things happen. And a lot of campaigns I've played on Legendary, very hard difficulty. Wolfric has actually ended up confederating all of Norska far more easily than you might think. It can end up being a brawl. It might not necessarily go Wolfric's way, but if he manages to confederate all of Norska under his thumb, then you will have a serious fight on your hand. Norska, pretty difficult fact. has a lot of issues when you're playing it. But obviously they get significant benefits and don't underestimate them when it comes down to it. So it's an exposed campaign position. Now, how do you play it? What do you do? Well, the reasonable thing would obviously be to take this army, especially if you have a mission over here. Take this army out. You cannot resolve it. Like, just take your initial army over here. Uh, always choose early on to get that influence bonus, unless you get a mission to take them out to, for influence. But you do need influence in a high elven campaign. And then... Once you're done with that, what I would probably recommend you do is you start moving over here. Maybe you set an ambush uh, ambush over here, but this army is unlikely uh, to march against you. But you might want to set an ambush over here against them because you might just bait this army into attacking uh, the monoliths uh, over here. Though you would also want to recruit two shadow warriors. If you're setting an ambush and you can, as you just as I just uh, as we just saw there. If you do set an ambush, you start recruiting two Shadow Warriors with the secondary army. You should recruit on turn one. If you're setting an ambush with, uh, if you're not setting an ambush, recruit them in Elif and Ars army and start recruiting global recruiting, especially if you've gotten some money from from the mission over here. Like having this army giving you a mission, it happens more often than not. Very rarely do I see this army here being the one with a mission. If you get a mission there, you should have enough. Uh, money to recruit at least some shadow walkers maybe not completely free because uh, it can be a bit expensive but enough money to start recruit global recruiting some some of those uh, shadow walkers over here and what do you want to do once you've el eliminated that initial army the best path is to go to silostra over here and tell her hey you're at war with these dark elves let me join in now you could opt for one of two choices over here you could either go for a non-aggression Pact, or you could just have her give her give you more money without a non-aggression pact. There's pros and cons with that particular approach. You're going to want to eliminate Silo Strat at one point anyway, but it's really your decision what you want to do. Do you want to just get a benefit from Silo Strat and non-aggression pact to secure a border? She will break it eventually. Make no mistake on that, or you will break it, and it's in your interest to do so. But do you want to eliminate Silostra very quickly, or do you want to leave that for later? There's pros and cons, as I've noted. If you do decide to eliminate Silostra, here's what you need to know. She has a pretty uh, large army over here. Not necessarily a powerful one, but certainly a lot of units here. She's going to take Kotex Column on the first turn, and she gonna, she's going to use a raise them mechanic for the Vampire Coast very, very quickly to... Uh, to get the full stack of units. She does have a damn pilot and she can get Aaron Knights very quickly as well as a, an ability. So I would recommend probably having a more substantial army than just uh, half a stack to deal with her. So maybe eliminating her is not necessarily the wisest idea unless you're really hardcore and you really want that challenge. An easier path it would be to, yes, take the Black Forest, sell it to Silostra, get, get that non-aggression pact for certain, again, uh, get some, that non-aggression pact, get the money, sell this territory to her, or just raise it to the ground, really, uh, when, it comes, uh, when it comes down to it. Maybe if you get a mission over here to deal with this particular army, that would certainly be worth it. It would be, you would probably get over 10,000 money, or 5,000 at the very least, from selling this element to Silostra, because... Diplom uh, diplomatically speaking, factions do like it when you sell them the last uh, territory in a province they control. So Silastra is going to have two of these settlements. She may want to get deferred as well. That's something you should be aware of when it comes to diplomacy. And then turn around, deal with Karen Carr. Or just eliminate this. Uh, yeah, so either go for Silastra directly or just take the Black Forest, sell it to Silastra, turn around, take Karen Carr, and then go deal with Silastra or go into the sea. Don't affect, don't screw you over your reliability rating on the diplomatic um, level. Or you could just take the Black Forest and just sell it to Silostra and not get the non-aggression pack. Though that's risky because that means she can declare war on you at any time. And if you lose the monoliths, that can set you back in your early game. By the way, take these two provinces. Don't be afraid of sacking all the settlements in these provinces because none of them are going to be above uh, tier 2. So what that means is none of them 
you'll always take them as tier one. So sack them for the extra money, get the money from uh, the mission. From the mission, you should be in a pretty good situation. And the way you should end up here is you should have a full stack of a combination of Shadow Warriors and Shadow Walkers. Can be a bit of an expense to recruit, uh, recruit them, but absolutely worth it. That's what the kind of army you should have for a Leafanar, because it's an expensive army to recruit, but not necessarily an expensive army to maintain for a Leafanar. Now, why should you get two armies very quickly in this campaign? Well, there's two reasons. One is so that the Leafanar's army isn't stopped one turn when you're taking over these settlements. So you just... You just sack these elements with the Leifanar, then you have your second army trailing them, and they're the ones that occupy them. And obviously, you're getting levels for your second army at the same time. And then you turn a Leifanar's army, you either deal with Silostra at this point, if you haven't gotten an integration pact, or if she's declared war on you. You turn your army around, you take her settlement, bam, you've got three provinces quickly. You're in an exposed situation, and you need to go to Ulf 1. Not for a huge amount of time. How much you want how much time you want to spend in Ulf 1, that's really up to you. You could take the entirety of Nagarif from these guys, but it's actually better in a lot of ways, especially when playing on legendary, very hard difficulty, for you to do the following. You come here, take the Shrine of Cain, maybe you take their capital, and then you sell all of that for the Phoenix uh, uh, to Alariel, who may get the Phoenix Gate. Either way, you want to get vision with Alariel. One of the ways you can do that is maybe getting, vi uh, getting a trade agreement with Alarian. You do need that vision because you need those trading relations with Ulfwan. Ulfwan itself, the Temperate Island, is just unpleasant climate for Leifanar for whatever a noble reason. I guess it's to push him really to deal with the Dark Elves and not just spend his vacation time in Ulfwan. Because if you can go in Ulfwan and you can colonize it, yeah, you can get really benefit from that star position. Like if you could abandon the star position, yeah, that would be a much easier campaign. Or you could just abandon the start position and just, yeah, expand the Nulf one. Would have a number of issues, but you could expand across the coast, deal with Morafi, bunch of plans. What I would prefer to do, though, is I take Wolf one, I sell it to Alarial, maybe I knock some heads with uh, Nakari or wipe out Nakari, but how much time you spend in Wolf one depends up to you. I personally prefer to spend as little time as possible. There is a quest, and it is important you do it because it's going to give you a lot of money. You will want the item itself. You want the Shadow Crown uh, over here. So you're going to want to do that mission. You're going to need to take the Shrine of Cain. This faction shouldn't really be able to stop you if you bring a full stack of Shadow Warriors and Shadow Walkers. You, by the way, also have a really good army for sieges, in particular against Dark Elven Settlements. Not necessarily High Elven Settlements, but Dark Elven ones. Because there's a dead zone in Dark Elven Settlements where you can just park your range units and just kill everything in sight. And you certainly have the range power to do so. Okay, so that's the initial situation, stabilize it. What do you do after that? Well, by this point, you should have two armies. One army with Shadow Warriors, Shadow Walkers, another ar army with Archers. Archers with Light Armor. You should try and get this particular structure quickly so you can get those Archers with Light Armor. And of course, you want to start getting Nobles. You want uh, Nobles, at least one Noble very quickly. You should have the influence to recruit one of the good ones. Now, what do you want to do after that? You could make the risky and stupid decision, as far as I see it, to just sail across the sea to deal with Hellebron. The thing is, if you sail into Hellebron's turf, she's going to throw three full stacks against you. It's not an unwinnable battle, but it's a lesson I learned the hard way. Hellebron is going to come for you. Now, you could try and eliminate her very quickly, but that's just going to expose you very quickly to Valkia, Sigvald, and Malekith. Maybe you don't want to do so, and of course you've got Tarx and other issues to the west. So after you take these three provinces, Delta the Nagareth situation one way or another, you may want to come over here and start uh, taking over these provinces. Settling them will obviously be complicated because what Tarx is going to do is he's going to put a hurt zone here, build a full army, take uh, uh, take Clark around over here very, very quickly. But you may want this province because although it's a difficult province to settle initially because a lot of these settlements are going to be burned to the ground, if not all of them, by Tarx. Tarx himself is a speed bump for you. His arm, He is powerful, but his army is nothing compared to yours. But you may want to take this province, take out his Hearthstone, and sell it to Katep, deal with the Witchwood, march over here, deal with Marathi. Or you take the Hearthstone, sell it to Katep, deal with the Witchwood, and then march north to annihilate Malekith. Dealing with Marathi might be the better decision, though, because she has some really great provinces, and Mansdamundi will certainly like you if you do so. So you either have a path north expanding uh, north or south. I'd the south one is probably the safer one. I guess this is the theme in this campaign. Going south is safer, going north is more risky uh, when it comes down to it. 
But at the same time, with these provinces, you're probably going to want to maintain a full stack. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Archers with light armor and spearmen with a mage lord like the one I have here. Either high magic or shadow magic can certainly hold this province. The thing to know about the situation here in terms of defense is the following. When an, an enemy marches, uh, marches an army across the sea and attacks a walled settlement, they're not, generally speaking, unless they have a ridiculous overwhelming force, they're not instantly going to attack it. So you have some flexibility in your defense. What you could do, since the shrine is a bit inland, what you could do is have an army here in ambush stands so that when Hellebron and Bellacor come over here, you just have the flexibility to just march very, very quickly to take them on. Now, Bellacor could be sneaky, he could go for the Twisted Glade, but three out of four uh, settlements by the sea are uh, capitals. Now, here's the thing about provincial capitals for both the Dark Elves and the High Elves. They're very easily defended. Now, the Dark Elves have that dead zone, the AI is not going to take advantage of it because the AI is stupid. If you can get a Dark Elven settlement to tier 3, the towers alone, not joking on this, I've seen this happen, I've played an entire campaign as a Leaf and Arya, I was a bit surprised by this, but the towers alone in a provincial capital in these Dark Elven settlements, because the terrain type is going to be the Dark Elven settlement, even when you control them, the towers alone may wipe out any attacking army, unless it's like Hellebron herself, but you throw the garrison, the towers, and a uh, defense force, you're going to be wiping out any attacker here. And you're going to earn truckloads of money from defeating Hellebron, Be uh, Bellacor again and again. So that's why I mean about going south being a viable option, because you can defend this territory. Yes, Malekith might come over here, and if you've taken this entire province, you might want to delay taking this province, by the way, just to have an easier time defending here. But if you've taken this entire province, Malekith will eventually start barreling towards you with his uh, stacks. Like Hellebron and Malekith, Hellebron in particular, have a lot of money in their campaigns. Like Hellebron herself, when I, when I, conf when I vassalized her as Valkia, she was giving me a tribute, not income, tribute would just like to uh, what three provinces or two and a half of 4k on legendary that's what you can expect she's gonna be rich she's gonna use that that gold to attack you again and again so you're playing defense in the north expanding in other parts once you've expanded sufficiently be aware of the vault uh, the morafi situation if you can uh, make an alliance with katep a military alliance that mean and give him some of this territory then he can form a bulwark or you can take this territory for yourself give Katep the Witchwood the Iron Sand Desert give that for him remember you have the underway you can navigate the mountains very quickly you can navigate around this terrain very very quickly deal with Morafi make some deals with Mazamundi maybe by selling him some of the territory here in the Ashen co uh, Coast and then, of course, deal with Malekith, deal with Hellebron with multiple stacks. By the way, by the point you've achieved all of this, you should be able to, uh, diplomatically, you should always look to increase your relations with Ulfan, but you're always going to increase your relations with Ulfan because you do have a lot of these missions give you diplomatic relations benefits with the High Elves. With Alariel, you should be able to achieve a military alliance pretty quickly. With Tyrion as well, very quickly, because he likes Alariel, so if you're friends with her, he's going to be friends with you. Alfarian is a bit slower, but eventually you'll be able to confederate all of Wolf 1 just passively by just doing these missions. Very easily. You don't have to, especially if you're selling some of this territory over here to, uh, to Alariel, or a lot of this territory over here to Alariel. You'll be able to do that. Once you do that, you unleash the Doom, stack, the doom Tide, of Alifanar, Alfarian, Tyrion, and Alariel on your enemies. It might take you a while to get all those confederations in place, but if you keep expanding, expanding aggressively, defending your territory over here, it will eventually happen. By the way, if you start getting a military alliance with uh, Tyrion and Alariel, they'll absolutely love the fact that you're annihilating again and again the armies of Halibron, Bellacor, and Malekith. That's, by the way, why you should play defense here and not try and expand against them, because you're not necessarily benefiting from that. You benefit from playing the long game with the with the Dark Elves and then taking them out. Though you could always try and say you could always in, uh, embark on the mission to save Grom Brindle. You have the tools to do so. You could just uh, hop on over here once you've dealt with all the situation here. Hop on over here, take this province, and maybe try and find a way to sell it to Grom Brindle. You may not be able to save his entire uh, his territory from being wiped out by Malekith, but Malekith is not going to do it so quickly. He's got other issues. He's got the Skaven to deal with. But eventually, Grom Brindle does lose to Malekith. 
on legendary very hard. But if you move quickly enough, you might save the, save the war dwarf himself. And Grumbrindel can be useful if you don't have the end game dwarf crisis enabled, because you can then take Valkia and sell this territory over here. Yeah, yeah Chaotic Wasteland is unsuitable for the dwarves, but he will buy it all the same, even though it's very worthless to him. And you can then use Grumbrindel, sell him a lot of this territory over here, all the way to here, to the shard lands, and use him as a defense point against these factions so you can take these provinces for yourself without having to worry about all the factions coming in from here to attack your territory, with the exception of obviously the port over here in the shard lands. Uh, or maybe not even that, really, because that's part of um, the, because uh, that's uh, obviously the part with the fortress of them, so you don't necessarily want that. So the only port you would actually have would be the one in the Deadwood. Those are some of your options. You can eventually, in the long term, deal with Norska. Remember, your campaign victory conditions uh, do require you to deal with all the Dark Elven factions. It is annoying to have to march to Lustria to deal with that, but eventually Rakarf will lose to the Lizardmen, though it will happen very, very slowly. So you might want to take an army, use the sea lane here, and just march it over here to just beat the crap out of Rakarf. One way or another, sell this territory to the Lizards, and then send several full stacks over here through this city lane, which will take you to Cafe to just beat Lokir Felhart. Assuming Cafe doesn't beat you to it. It may happen, it may not happen, I've seen it happen both ways. Generally speaking though, Cafe will eventually beat Snitch and Lokir, though in some exception, in some situations it may not end up happening uh, when it comes down to it. So you might have to march across the world. After that, you've got the world. You can do whatever the hell you want in your campaign. Of course, a lot of the territory is not necessarily suitable to you, so you may have some issues for that, but you could decide, hey, let's just go into the Badlands, meet Scarbrand as a Leafanar, because the Wasteland is suitable. Or just decide to head over here and teach Emmerich, who is the real noble of Wolf One, and confederate Great. Emmerich as well. This is, by the way, um, like, you could go on the world adventure to try and confederate every, every legendary lord, of the High Elves. Teclis is difficult as any faction, even as Tyrion. But that's the situation in this campaign. Those are the things to be aware of. I love this campaign. It has a lot on offer. It can be very interesting. You have a bunch of options. Though There's some options better than others, but or all of them are viable in their own way. So great campaign, great design, great legendary lord, lots of power, but also difficult enemies to deal with.